Hello everyone, welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affair Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your part number 4 of the first test that was conducted on 5th of February and today we are going to discuss the last set of 25 questions which were remaining. And I really really hope that you guys have enjoyed the first 3 parts, you have learned a lot of new things and I am sure you got a bit of the idea of the questions and how to approach them. In this particular video we have something very special for you and we have included one kind of a thing which is going to make the understanding of the questions even more uh, you know clear in your head how to approach your questions. I am sure this new thing that we have added is going to give you more insights. So let's see for yourself what we have included and let's get started with the test discussion guys. Question number 76 which was asked in your exam was about the Eurasian Economic Union. So before I discuss about this particular union and we, we figure out which statements are correct or not, you first need to understand why these kind of questions appear in the, in the exam. So basically any, uh, you know, any important uh, union organization group which comes into the news that by default captures the uh, attention of the UPSC exam makers, right? In this particular case, it is about the Eurasian Economic Union. Now, if you analyze the quality of the question, of course, there are so many, uh, you know, factual things which were asked about the particular year, about the particular members, where you really do not have scope of the guesswork because they are very, very particular, peculiar things which were asked and you cannot do any guesswork about it. So before I come to uh, the question and how to approach it, you need to know a basic things about the Eurasian Economic Union, which was in the news for quite some time. What you sh what you, sh you should always read about these kind of organization, for example, this particular European uh, Economic Union, as the name says, it is about the economic as well as political union, which was established way back in 2015, okay? Now, since it is an economic union, what, what exactly things you can expect from these kind of unions? Since it is economic, there is going to be a common market, there is going to be a policy of a single currency which exactly these people are doing and uh, this particular union is trying to bring a single currency by 2025 most likely it's going to be euro and similarly since it's a political union as well what polit logically what political union will do it is going to have a coordinated foreign and security policies so that every member state is going to have the same stand on all geopolitical and geoeconomical issues right now this particular European uh, uh, Economic Union, Euro uh, European Economic Union is a kind of supranational framework. Supranational framework means where you have given authority to one central organization which is going to govern a lot of rules and regulations of your country. Now in this particular case, of course, all the members of the, uh, of the Eurasian Economic Co Commission, uh, it is a central authority which is going to implement the rules and regulations so that there is uniformity in all the member states across their policies and all their major rules that they are going to make, right? So same, same kind of supranational framework is there and in this particular case it is European uh, uh, Economic Commission as well as the Court of Eurasian Economic Union. So these two are the supra. Supranational means where you have one authority and lot of na lot of nations, the authority is wide across many nations, that's why the word is supranational, okay? Also, if you, if you look at the members, because you have to be very careful about the members, a lot of time UPSC make these small, small changes. They may give you two, three uh, accurate names, two, three names are going to be the bogus names, right? So you have to be careful about the members. In this particular case of Eurasian Economic, you are supposed to remember these names. There is no alternative to that. You have to stick things in your head. So it is Armenia. You can see here the Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan and Russia. And always whenever you read any topic and if, if in, it includes a name of a country or a place, I always say please go and check out there and then that thing on the map. The more you see your map, the more you are comfortable with the world map, things become easy in your exam. Sometimes even if you have to have a guesswork, things become really easy if you have a basic understanding of the map. Okay. Now coming back to the question which was asked about the Eurasian uh, uh, this uh, economic union. So if you look at the question, it says it is economic political union. Yes, we have just understood the, the uh, year of establishment is also correct, but you have to be careful because sometimes they, they may change the year of establishment. They may make it 2023, 20, 24 or may take it like very long back. 
so this here you have to be very careful about the ear particular there is no absolutely no guesswork which is there so first statement looks uh, looks exactly correct which 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 is there about the Euro, uh, Eurasian economic union look at the second statement it was about the current members okay so here also you can only attempt this question if you are absolutely 100% sure if you have read this kind of statement because if let us say you have you have never re read about this uh, kind of union so i would say you should skip it S try to skip this kind of question if you are not 100% sure if or if you have not read about it there is no space for the guesswork and third statement also is correct here which says supranational framework and we have the governing bodies like these two which we, we have already discussed so i would say this kind of question uh, is a bit tough in case you have not, not read it and for most of the student these kind of uh, these kind of questions are medium so only try to uh, attempt this if you have some knowledge otherwise my opinion these are very fact based questions in case you have no clue you should always skip these kind of questions only attempt when you are comfortable in your approach okay so right answer in this case has to be c that is all the three statements are correct next question that was asked about the uh, in the test which was question 77 was about the bucharest 9 so bucharest what is bucharest at least you should have basic idea it is the capital of romania since it's the capital of romania and it is about the bucharest 9 9 here is the number of members how many members are part of this particular group now this again is again very fact based questions if you have never read it i would say never go approach these kind of questions there is even not even a single scope of uh, you say uh, guesswork because look at the options i mean if you are clueless bucharest 9 can be anything it can be regional security defense cooperation can be cultural historical grouping can be about economic integration it can be anything so only attempt if you have read about it i mean these are the questions which are not to be done with a blind eye it will always give you negative marking in most of the cases before we come back to this first let's understand what, what this group is all about the so bucharest 9 is which is also sometimes called the b9 group it it was founded in 2015 and this bucharest, uh, bucharest 9 is about the nine nato countries nato is north atlantic treaty organization countries in total we have 31 members of nato where finland being the latest to join and probably probably most likely sweden is going to be the next one joining the nato countries but this bucharest 9 is about the nine those particular countries which lies geographically in eastern europe okay and which are these particular countries you should always pay attention to the member so we have romania poland hungary bulgaria czech republic slovakia and the three baltic countries which are estonia latvia lithuania remember sometimes they may ask you okay which of the following is a baltic republic baltic is a sea basically if you if you look, look at the map we have a sea called baltic sea and the countries surrounding it are called they are called the baltic republic so these three are there now b9 group is in general called the voice of the eastern flank you know the eastern eurasian countries they have a collective voice in the form of b9 group right and of course all these uh, nine countries they have some uh, cultural and historical bond because many of them were part of the original ussr the soviet union right now this particular group what this group is all about now the major uh, work of this group is about collaboration on security issues of course other things are there you have kind of economic integration sustainable development but they are not the major goals in this kind of questions you have to figure out what is the major objective of that particular group what is the core goal that they are going to serve okay so b9 is about the security issues collective security that they are working upon so now if you look at the question once again you can figure out the right answer has to be a alliance on regional security defense cooperation i think this is a this is a tough question you should you should uh, skip it in case you do not know if you have read about it and you are 100% sure then only attempt otherwise this there is absolutely no guesswork i am repeating again there has to be no guesswork because it will cost you negative marking there are some questions where you can apply your logical understanding but here you cannot go with any logic it is purely fact based questions then the question 78 was a very common kind of question which upsc is fond of they uh, in if you go through the previous year question you will see lot many times upsc ask you about these vaccines and the particular diseases 
Now, majorly which vaccines they target, especially, especially those vaccines which are in the current uh, issues, which are in the news for some kind of reason. And here you have the three that BCG, MMR and DTAP, the three are given to you. And you are supposed to figure out the uh, figure out about the vaccines. Now, in this particular one, yes, uh, the BCG vaccine is the most common. I think this is something we all have heard about it. It is probably the one of the most common and famous vaccine to treat the disease of the tuberculosis. That is absolutely correct. Then, then we have the MMR. MMR is basically the name of a vaccine. And here MMR is also about the diseases that it covers. So it, it is about the measles, mumps and rubella. Here R is uh, standing from the rubella disease. Okay, rotavirus vaccine is not MMR. So rotavirus vaccine in general, there are many, but the most common one and very recently that we have added is called rotavac. Few years back, Rotavac vaccine was uh, uh, finalized for the rotavirus. So absolutely this is wrong. I mean here also, there is no scope of the guesswork. If you have read about these vaccines, if you know uh, about their particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, facts about it, then only you can attempt. These are very fact-based questions. DTAP is about the three diseases, which is called diphtheria, tetanus, T A P is called pertussis. Pertussis has another name called the whooping cough. Okay, so very specifically asked questions, only attempt in case you know, otherwise I think it's a medium kind of question and uh, then you have to decide, you can, you should only risk these kind of questions if you still want to have a guesswork, at least you should have an uh, idea about the two, out of the three if you are, if you know very well about the two, then still you can go for it, but now please be very careful, look at this particular uh, uh, pattern of the UPSC. There was a time when we, we, you could have go for the elimination technique. Right? Now you can't go with the elimination because they are not asking you which statement is correct. They are asking how many pairs are correct. So in this kind of situation, elimination technique also won't give you much benefit. But you have to be very comfortable and confident, confident then you should approach it. So in this case, answer has to be 2 because we have figured out that MMR is not for rotavirus. It's a medium question. But skip it or risk it depending upon if you if you if you are not sure about cutting the uh, you know uh, uh, going above the cutoff. If you are somebody who is struggling to you know figure out if I do not know I don't have much scope to go with the cutoff then you can risk it but at, even in that case at least you should be aware of one or two fact then you should go for it okay. Be careful about these questions these are factual based questions and and I would also advise you guys. Uh, just go through all the major vaccines which were in the news for and even in, in like uh, for 2024 I would recommend you guys do uh, you know search for the cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is more in the news these times so they may ask you about the cervical ca cancer vaccine so all the latest ones especially the post covid vaccines do read about the post covid vaccines because uh, this is one favorite part that UPSC will always target so be very careful about the vaccines whenever you read try to remember the diseases that they cover question number 79 was about the particular NAFED NAFED stands for National Agricultural Cooperative Marketing Federation of India Limited now in these kind of questions sometimes it is very obvious that you may have not heard about these kind of uh, groups but in that particular case of course you can't skip everything you ultimately have to solve the questions right in this particular kind of question or these particular kind of groups, try to read the name twice or thrice. The, the key to the answer lies in the name. Here I would say there are two important keys that I can figure out. One is agricultural, another is cooperating marketing. At least this much I have to keep in my mind. Again, it is something that we have to we, we, we will learn about NAFED because they are asking you about which particular act they are registered and all that stuff right okay now I would say um, okay first let me explain you the NAFED part and then you can see that even with some kind of common sense you can attempt these kind of questions even if you are not very comfortable look at the name agriculture look at the name cooperative if there is something if there is any cooperative uh, you know uh, uh, federation if there is, if there is any organization which is based on the cooperative setup do you think the cooperative setups are ever going to be registered as a company act? No. Mostly the cooperatives are going to be registered under the cooperative society act. One fault is something I can see here. Even if you are not able to figure out, then look at the second, the second part of the statement. It says the NEFED is about 
profit maximization for the shareholder now you see if you have a basic idea about the cooperative societies and groups they are not they are not here to make the profit part cooperatives are basically to support to benefit the farmers they benefit the members cooperative is about benefiting their members not about the profit making so i can clearly figure out not even by looking at the fact but simple by common sense i could have simply eliminated the first statement rest for the rest too you need to have some basic knowledge that i am going to share with you first look at that uh, statement look at the information that you need to know and then we'll come back to the question so first is something we have already figured out that this has to be the case so this nefed is uh, uh, it works under the multi state cooperative society act which we have already figured out even without proper information always remember nefed is a very important organization under the ministry of agriculture and they are the group they are the nodal agencies their main job is the price stabilization measure they are responsible for the price stabilization in terms of agriculture and that is why nefed is the organization which actually ensure the farmers are going to get the minimum support prices in case there is any kind of market fluctuation nefed always intervene and ensure the msp for the farmers and it is basically done so that any market fluctuation is not going to impact the income of the farmers and that whole purpose is to reduce the farmer distress hai na that is the basic cause that is the basic uh, idea behind making the nefed one more statement that you should be aware of is that in which ministries they are working so i i have just told you nefed is under the ministry of agriculture always remember the ministries are the key they are very important sometimes upsc play tricks on this particular uh, thing so you really have to be careful about which particular ministry are, are we talking about knowing a bit more about the nefed always remember it is the major objectives is distribution of agricultural machineries i mean every input that farmer is purchasing nefed also help the farmers in terms of input i mean providing them machineries implement at a very nominal prices they also are responsible for any interstate import export trade they are also responsible for maintaining the warehouses under the warehouse act and at the end if any any farmer needs loan so nefed also provide uh, advance loan to the members and that is their major job now if you come back to the question which was asked in your test look the first we have already figured out is a wrong statement please read the third statement it said nefed plays minimum role in price stabilization for agriculture commodities i mean very general if you apply your common sense here if there is any organization which is of agriculture cooperative market marketing i mean it is very obvious that they are not going to have a minimum role if they have, if they are going to have a minimal role then why they are formed at a first place no so this is something very extreme in the question always look out for the keywords this minimum maximum exclusive only all these are the statements you should be more careful about so of course i can if i have if i do not even know about it i can still go with the framework i can still go with the uh, you know guess work and i can say no this looks a bit wrong so it is not about the minimal role they have the they have they are the nodal agency it is their job to do the price stabilization ensuring the msp we have learned about it right so i think in this particular kind of questions and the second statement is very obvious it's correct it is under ministry of agriculture no problem and primarily it is about improving farmer income and cooperative marketing that you can figure out from the name also in this statement two are wrong one is absolutely correct so answer has to be one only in my opinion these are the questions you should definitely attempt i say why they may look tough they may look medium that is okay if you have read then it, it is easy but even if they are medium do not give up so easily apply some common sense here and that is the approach you should follow okay so i would say attempt these kind of questions because you can't keep skipping everything even if you are not comfortable sometimes question look very difficult but if you take a second reading third reading of the paper you will understand the things in a better way in a better manner okay that is what it is then we have the next question number 80 was about the cluster munitions it was about the convention the convention on the cluster munitions now here this is the keyword if you know the basic meaning of a cluster munition because it was very much in the news let me tell you specifically after this russia ukraine uh, war cluster munition is something which was in the news for the last entire year for some way or the other right now if the question is about the cluster munitions you should think do i know about the meaning of cluster munitions 
okay i understand sometimes you are not comfortable with the information but just try to analyze try to imagine what cluster munition is all what is a cluster when you have so many things different different things and i am putting them as one this is my cluster right cluster is about the agglomeration of many things munition is something to do with the weapons it is something to do with the bombs and some kind of weapons right so in general you have to think and uh, think about the keywords which are important now we'll come to the detail part but first let me explain you the exact meaning of the cluster munitions look at the map guys look at this particular figure you you you, you have a clear demonstration what this cluster bomb does so cluster here is one single bomb which is a cluster munition it is fired from the ground or the air doesn't matter once it is fired on its way on its trajectory it somewhere start disintegrating and within that before hitting the target it start releasing many single single bomblets and these small small bomblets coming from one particular bomb they are they they discriminately fall on every place i mean this is something where you are targeting for mass destruction you are not targeting any one specific target it is not about i have to hit the target a no from my flight to b to a i am going to destroy everything in between that is where the cluster munition comes and it was in news because russia russia has used these kind of uh, uh, cluster munitions against the ukraine and russia was criticized for uh, doing such things because ultimately it is the civilians which are going to be impacted the most right now coming back to the question cluster munitions legally binding international treaty prohibit the use production stockpiling and transfer of munitions makes sense if you have basic about idea about the cluster you should say okay yes i understand they are not good to use so they must have been banned now one thing is definitely a key word you know some uh, conventions are not legally binding now this is something you have to be careful about now here thankfully the convention on cluster munition is legally binding because there are sometimes there are uh, you know conventions which are voluntary in nature so try to you can't remember every convention which is voluntary but there are very less conventions which are legally binding so try to remember those at least which are legally binding conventions second statement is something you can uh, you can attempt with a common sense these are explosive devices containing sub munitions that is why the name is cluster munition and they are if there's something going to have sub munitions they are going to scatter to the wider area and indiscriminate harm it will do to the civilians and all that right makes sense third statement is something you should be careful about third statement was that india signed this particular as part of ceasefire violation against china have you heard anything of that sort have you heard anything that india has signed because these are the kind of conventions india always maintain a distance given the fact india's hostility with the pa pakistan and china well i have not ever heard so there are chances that india would not have signed any kind of these uh, uh, you know these are basically the problems most related to the western countries india still not go with these kind of fight modes so you can say no india has not signed we have and it is also saying currently so i if you have not heard something that has that has been done in one year or two year so clearly india has not signed these kind of things in fact in fact usa was criticizing russia the most right on using the cluster munition to a fun fact i can tell you even russia even usa has not signed this convention look at the hypocrisy level usa was criticizing russia usa itself has not signed the convention so far so i can see here the answer uh, is only two the two statements are correct i would say this particular i'm not saying it's very easy it is a medium kind of thing but you should attempt it don't give up you should definitely go with these kind of questions just by applying some of the common sense and just by trying to decode the meaning it is important and that's what upsc prelims is going to check how present how good presence of mind you guys have right now next question was about uh, it was a map based question uh, uh, it says that which of the following country is a member of european union situated geographically outside the area of the european mainland continent okay now i understand it's a factual question you would say but try to understand and try to learn about just try to figure out some some basic facts you know the if you are very sure about the members i mean european union is something which is having 27 members right right now european union have 27 members used to have 28 because but now uh, after the brexit 
the Brexit has happened, so United Kingdom is no longer a part of European Union. Now 27 members. It is very difficult to remember the name of 27, I understand. Nobody knows the exact name of 27, you may miss a few. But try to apply the basic common sense. Now, here I am talking about the key word is important. It is, it is uh, said, you have to figure out that particular member which is part of European Union but it is geographically outside. Geographically outside, most likely it, it is going to be an island. Understood? It is not part of mainland, it is part of geographically outside. So probably it's going to be somewhere, some island that is part but a bit aloof. Is Turkey fall in that category? No. Turkey is not a part of European Union itself. It is. It, it has never joined. Albania, Montenegro, though they are also not the member, but to you may get some confusion, but still they are attached to the mainland Europe. So here by applying this normal common sense, for in, in the first instance, you may get confused, you may get frightened. Okay, this is a very tough question. I have not heard about it. Apply your common sense. Which country is supposed to be the island country? It is the Cyprus. Cyprus is that particular uh, group. It is the particular country which is part of European Union. It is and it is geographically outside and other particular countries are part of the mainland. So cannot be the answer. So I would say this kind of questions are easy. You must attempt it in case you are having difficulty. Try to go with some kind of intuition, some kind of common sense here. Now, if I if I have to show you this map, look at this map. This is these, these are the 27 countries of European Union. I'm sure you cannot remember the name of every country. But look here. Do you see uh, do you see Turkey being a part of no? See the Turkey. Turkey is not a part of European Union. Similarly, somewhere here you have Alba, Albania and you have the uh, Montenegro. They are also not the part. Look at this particular country, Cyprus. This is the Cyprus, guys. So Cyprus is an uh, island, not part of the mainland. It is aloof, but still a part of European Union. So sometimes the question looks difficult. And especially if you have not read much about that particular thing, I understand. But sometimes you can also attempt that question with a basic understanding, with a basic presence of mind. You have to control your nerves in the paper, okay? Sometimes it happens, the question looks very difficult, but then you have to keep yourself cool. When you read about it, then you can see, okay, I am getting some clue. UPSC prelims is not about how much you know about the question. It is about the approach that you follow in the question, okay? That is the most important point. That is the key point that we are looking for, okay? Now, going with the question number 82. Now, this question is again a very typical map-based question. I mean, in this, I would say it is not about, it is not going to be solved by any common sense. Now, for this kind of question, it is absolutely fact-based. This question is 100% fact-based. You should attempt it only if you have practiced the map before going to the exam. I mean, I would say this is something you should always be careful. Now, in this question, different straits are being asked. What is a strait, by the way? Straits are narrow water body that connect the larger water bodies, okay? Be careful. The straits are those narrow waterways, water bodies that connect the two larger water bodies. That is called a strait. Now, here you have the name. The, you have the name of Kerch Strait, the Bosphorus Strait, and the Dardanelles Strait. If you have not about it, if you have not heard about it, then I mean this is a kind of medium question, but you can skip it. Don't risk it. I would never say risk it. You should skip it if you have no idea. If you are 100, chodo, you are 200% sure, na, then only attempt these kind of questions. So first let's try to understand and learn few things about the straits here. The three straits which were mentioned. So you, you see here, we there is a uh, on the north of Black Sea, we have a Kerch Strait. Kerch Strait is the uh, narrow strait that connects Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. Okay, definition you remember, na? narrow water body connecting the two larger bodies. So, Kerch Strait connects the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. Okay, correct. Then we have the Bosphorus Strait. Bosphorus is when you are going to exit from the Black Sea. So, very near to the Turkey, there is a place called Istanbul which is part of uh, Turkey only. So, near Istanbul you have this narrow waterway called the Strait of Bosphorus. So Black Sea and the, yes, there is Sea of Marmara. Okay, so uh, sea, uh, Bosphorus is the one connecting the Sea of Marmara here and the Black Sea. Here is the location of Bosphorus. And if then you come out, then you have another, uh, uh, you know, another strait called the Strait of Dardanelles, which is actually the exit gateway from this uh, Sea of Marmara. You, you are coming out and you are uh, going to have, uh, you are going to enter the Aegean Sea. 
all these are all these body aegean sea sea of crete you know tyrian sea they are all actually extension of the mediterranean sea it is the mediterranean extension only that we consider okay now <coughs> please i want you guys to note one particular thing one thing that you should know about the strait of dardanelles it has it is absolutely located in turkey you see it is the turkey that is going to control these two bosphorus and dardanelles are exclusively the the domain of territory and clearly greece is not going to be a partner because there is no absolute boundary uh, that we we can see around the Dar sea of dardanelles right now you are comfortable with these and i would also advise you guys practice all important straits every important strait because its straits are mostly they are considered to be choke points what is a choke point choke points are those strategic locations which can impact the global economics global politics in case they are choked by some particular forces and there is any kind of disturbance everything get disturbed they, these are choke points so you see all these straits all these straits all the isthmus are considered to be choke points and specifically the uh important strait there are 10 to 15 straits i would recommend you guys do the map practice before you enter all important straits that you that especially those uh, like for example this particular area is very much in the news now because of russia ukraine the whole black sea something which is in the news so that is why it is important and similarly right now i would recommend you guys do check out important straits of the indian ocean as well right the indian ocean straits are also very important indian ocean as well as the pacific and atlantic go and look at the all three four important straits now if you are going back to the question which was asked now it says the kerch strait connects the black sea with the aegean absolutely not where is the aegean sea where is the black sea no so uh, uh, first statement is wrong kerch is not between black sea and aegean it is between black sea and the sea of azov we have just see, uh, we have uh, seen that right then it is asking about the bosphorus strait it is the narrowest strait yes it is among all the international navigation so this is another interesting fact for bosphorus it is the narrowest strait that we see so second is also correct no problem then we have the dardanelles strait separate europe and asia it is correct it separate europe and asia we have seen europe as in the greece is the first country to enter the europe and last country of the asia is turkey yes but is it a part of the border between turkey and greece no i specifically mentioned that strait of dardanelles and bosphorus are exclusive the part of uh, turkey they uh, greece has nothing to do greece share a border with turkey but not through this particular strait so this is also wrong answer has to be one now how to approach this kind of question i again i'm saying they are tough questions if you are if you are not sure please skip it risk it only if you have some information some idea even if you have uh, 50 to 70% information then you can risk it but skip it in case you have no idea because very fact based question and something you cannot figure out in the exam itself okay very important next question was again very interesting question 83 and uh, here you are supposed to answer uh, you have to figure out which country is being mentioned in the question now this is again something you have to go with the kind of map based question you need to have some good map information you should be comfortable and you see every question has some map relevance no i mean i would always suggest you have to be very careful with the map marking before you go to the exam question 83 you are supposed to figure out a country country bound to the north by atlantic sea so it is if it is going to be bounded by atlantic sea means that it has to be a country lying in the southern hemisphere that is making sense climate characterized by high temperature means uh, the country should be having you know uh, which which kind of characteristics we are the we the high temperature abundant rainfall well this is a very typical characteristic of a tropical uh, climate no so the country must have a, cli a, a, a tropical climate i mean probably this these two are not going to help you a lot why see all the four countries venezuela guana bolivia colombia they they all belong to south america and south american countries all these country have these two almost almost these two characteristics now of course if you have the idea you know that so venezuela is something which is a bit of west probably not atlantic is not going to have uh, it at at the north right well that is the key in this particular question the first two may not give you bit of the answer the the key statement to figure out about the statement is this third one now this is the only south american nation which has english as the official language you know all the southern american countries the latin uh, countries 
they mostly have spanish if you have a bit of understanding of the history you know all the latin american countries they have spanish as their official language spanish is something because spanish rule was there for uh, for a, a huge amount of time for, for a longer period english they speak english they use english but which particular country have office english as the official language is something interesting fact and for that matter it is the guana that qualifies to be the right answer now in this question again i'm saying this is again a question which where you should not go with the risk, uh, uh, guesswork these are very factual these are tough questions you can apply a bit of common sense but you can't solve the whole with the common sense so you need to have some knowledge of the fact so in this case it is something you should skip if you are not comfortable approach i told you you try to figure out the key statement sometimes you are not going to give the answer from two at least try to figure out and you know get into the nerves of each question right but they are not easy question i understand you should not uh, risk it for any reason now if you look at the map you will get the information so here are the four countries which we, we were asking so look at the look at the guana guana is one such uh, country which is having definitely the uh, you know we are having the atlantic at the north we have and it lies near the equator look at this is the equator which is there right look at this this is zero degree so near the equator that's why it has a tropical climate yes we have to just figure out but even by attempting though even see look at uh, venezuela venezuela also has uh, atlantic extension in the north right or it is it is also going to be the even colombia colombia also has tropical but the third statement was the key it is the guana only which is having the english as the official language it is very risky question i would not say uh, you guys to go and attempt it you should have a little bit of information then only you can do that now question number 84 it is something which is very important question 84 was about the critical minerals of india okay let's say i do not know anything about critical minerals just try to apply your common sense what critical mineral can be what which mineral i should think of a critical mineral critical minerals may be those which are uh, very important for our uh, you know industries yes they are the critical minerals but why they are considered to be so critical probably because india does not have those minerals but we but we need it what thing becomes critical for us critical is something you cannot do without it you need it at any cost so the minerals which are very very important for our industries they are very important but india does not have them in abundance and if we do not have in abundance we are totally import dependent on those minerals yes or no logically critical mineral is very important but we have a shortage so only option is that we have to import those particular kind of minerals that is the important key now look at the look at the three uh, look at the four options which of them are considered to be critical that is some, something you have to figure out so we have the option as tungsten silver phosphorus and copper tricky question right but you go with the with the basic uh, you know uh, common sense here phosphorus yes definitely it is supposed to be critical because we know india need lot of fertilizers and you must have heard about the npk fertilizer right the nitrogen phosphorus and potassium so phosphorus is something which is very critical so yes it is copper india has india has its own copper production also but india's copper reserves are not sufficient to fulfill our demands so copper is also something we mostly import we import in a lot of huge uh, volume tungsten is also very very important for us it is the silver so far silver is not qualified to be silver is not qualified to be critical have you uh, where have you heard the you know uh, uh, industrial importance of silver have you have heard of the uh, you know in industrial significance of silver much no i think it is mainly with the jewelries and all and definitely we have not yet classified it as a critical mineral so in this case in this case answer has to be 3 i think this is a medium one uh, you should you should you can risk it i would say you can risk it in case you are not aware by simply going at least you are aware of two or three facts then you can apply a bit of common sense and then you can risk it if you are aware of it then it is easy you should you will definitely attempt but i am asking i am telling you from the from the student who face difficulty in solving the questions but these kind of question you can still risk Uh, because you have uh, you have a little bit idea about the critical minerals okay to give you a bit more information on that guys in total there are 30 minerals 
which are considered to be critical minerals which are qualified by ministry of uh, mining okay here is a complete list you can read uh, the names all the names you can read specifically for tungsten you should know because uh, we are dependent and uh, it is all by import that we are getting silver is not what we have classified okay so uh, i think you should you can risk these kind of questions in case you are not sure of cutting the uh, you are going par with the cut off you can you can still attempt with little bit of confidence and common sense question number 85 okay now this for many students this was a very difficult question this question is about the term phonon i mean we all get frightened when we hear of something that we have not heard of right phonon looks very alien to us okay what is a phonon is it about is it a you know packet of energy is it uh, is it about the sound waves or is it about the electronic waves or they are gravitational waves or the seismic waves we have absolutely no no idea but i would say something to you please read this word again read the word phonon again what you think when you when you talk about the word phonon phonon has something to do with phonic phonic right what is phonic you do do you do the telephonic conversation no think about phonon think about phonic and think about telephone telephone phonic phone is something to do with the science of sound at least you can you can apply some of some common sense here that phonic has to do something with sound it is the science of sound that is called phonic and i'm sure you have if you if you go by this kind of uh, uh, attempt at least you know that phonon has something to do with sound now things becomes easy for you i mean you have you uh, some uh, gravitational waves you are you have read for so far and the packet of energy for the gravitational waves we have read it they are called gravitons though they exist or not it is still a debatable thing it is only by the theory we have we have uh, theoretically understood there is something called as graviton though we are not yet we are they are yet to be discovered in practical sense have you ever heard of the packet of energy of seismic waves we have never heard of something called uh, packet of energy no seismic waves give straight away the seismic energy they are the one responsible for the earthquakes so clearly you can eliminate this clearly you can eliminate this now the the only doubt that you may have in your head is between the sound waves and electronic waves please try to recall the small packet of energy of light or the electronic waves is something we call them as photons very common in your geography you have read it n number of times the photons photons are those small packet of energy which is coming from the sun so now only option that you have and if you have understood if you have decoded the word phonic related to phot phonon with the phonic then the logical answer i am saying this kind of question can be solved by logic even if you if i have not read anything about it i can still solve it it has to do something with the sound if i have to risk it i will definitely risk it because for me it might look tough but it is actually medium kind of difficulty level i would risk it with the with uh, with the sheer sense of logic okay so sometimes you are not aware of the of the word but try to try to at least you have no option you can't skip everything but try to go with the science behind that word try to apply some logic in the paper and you are going to be uh, doing something better okay that is important question 86 was about the national strategy for robotics okay now this is again very logic based question i would say here you need to have logic plus you also need to have a little bit of luck i'll i'll tell you how the question is about national strategy for robotics okay now the question is about which ministry of india is has recently released this national strategy for robotics in nutshell they are, they want you to give the answer which ministry is responsible for robotics in india okay now this is now again the whole thing is just to confuse you don't get confused with the long statement okay the nutshell is they are asking you which ministry is responsible for robotics in india well you know robotics has robotics is all based on ai robotics is something to do with the technology yes it is something to do with high level technology advanced technology artificial intelligence that's why that's how the robotics robot robotics you know the robots right the robots how they work they are all high tech cutting edge technologies try to apply the logic do you think robotics can have something to do with skill development absolutely not i can eliminate it 
do you think robotics has to do something with information broadcasting no absolutely no so two to definitely i can eliminate now i have a 50 50% chance let's say i'm not sure the only confusion you have is with these two ministries ministry of science and tech and ministry of electronics and it i would say even if i have 50 50 chance my common sense will say okay i will go with the ministry of information technology because that makes something more relevant more relatable to the robotics let us say i have never ever heard of this news but still i can figure out with my logic and little bit of luck i can say okay it is the ministry of electronics and uh, it which is called the maithi that looks more logical i would definitely risk it for me it is actually not very easy but it is kind of medium but i would definitely risk this kind of questions because at least i have 50 50% chance then i can go for it in case you you are not aware of all the four and all four options looks tricky then you should skip it but at least if you have 50 50 chance i think you should definitely go and risk it because ultimately you have to get par with the with the cut off only right so talking about the maithi guys very important maithi is, is the nodal in fact it is the nodal agency for robotics in india now that i want you guys to remember because robotics is the future and that is something you have to be very careful about and and the our our objective the uh, the mission the idea behind the national strategy for robotics is that india should be a global leader in robotics by 2030 that is the idea behind it okay and everything about robotics all the testing demonstration commercialization supply chain development everything is to be done by this particular ministry <coughs> pardon i have i have a bit of running nose today so uh, pardon if i am not sounding very uh, fine to you i i am really sorry for that <coughs> question number 87 now here you were supposed to talk about the um, you have to figure out the right statement and the question was about the first ever indigenous installation of the atomic clock this is my keyword atomic clock of rubidium doesn't matter to me much but it is about the atomic clock that is important where i have installed the atomic clock in the navik satellite 1 now you have to consider the following and you have to give the answer first of all navik is something i expect you guys to know because navik is something which is in the news since 2015 Since 2015, Navig Navig stands for Navigation with Indian Constellation. Now it is it is talking about the navigation with Indian Constellation. Okay. Now what is this na- navigation with Indian Constellation? This is simply to put in in a simple words, it is our alternative to the GPS. Global positioning system is something that it is it is a USA made uh, uh, you know system. right now wherever we have to go we always follow the gps right so gps is all usa based technique now that indian version of gps is navik navik has satellite system and what we have done so far in the navik satellite system there are seven it's a group of seven satellite satellites it's a network of seven satellites some of them are in geosynchronous some of them are in geostationary orbit so four of them are geostationary and geosynchronous that is why that is how they have divided it and in general what they have done that around india i mean covering the mainland india and approximately 1500 km you know area around the india that is the navigation that we had developed so far of course it's not going to be used for all of, of all of the world it is to serve the mainland india and 1500 km around it that is the range of the navig system which we have developed it's a seven satellite network now to be to be more precise uh in terms of navigation you know we have installed the atomic clocks atomic clock is what you have you have a normal clock okay atomic clock is something which is uh, which is every time in especially in the science experiments in any experiment where you need precision any kind of experiment or space flight or anywhere in physics or space wherever there is need of a precision if precision is needed you have to be 110% accurate even with your millisecond you have to be you have, you need to have that kind of accuracy you always go with the atomic clocks atomic clocks are basically those clocks which actually use the frequency of the atom atoms the time is determined using the frequency of the atom atoms their energy levels and all that are calculated and atomic clock work on the frequency of the atoms so at least i have this much in my head that there has to be something to do with precision and it is something to do with the accuracy okay 
Now I'll try to give the answer of this particular question. With my very basic common sense, I'm going to give the answer of this. First statement says, now this uh, atomic clock in navigation, first statement says, ability to provide accurate location data, yes, I, even if I'm not, even if I have not heard about it, I can still say it, is, it looks correct because what logic says, it has to be correct. Look at the third statement. It helps to communicate swarms of small satellite with each other. Yes. How, how, you, can, uh, how you can have an accurate location when the satellites will communicate with each other. Very logical. First and third are interrelated. Fourth statement says it has ability to share precise data. Of course, we are talking about precision all the time. Right. And fourth is also correct. Now, there is something which is very extreme, something very extreme in the second statement. It says it helps to identify, destroy the space debris. Isn't it looking as if it's a too ambitious thing? I mean, okay, fine, you are uh, locating things accurately and that is uh, something okay. But do you think atomic clocks in the Navig, we have designed Nav Navig for this particular purpose. We are going to identify and destroy space debris in real time. Now this, to me, this looks as if it is too ambitious. Something that I'm sure I'm not going to do in because Navik is still in a very initial stage, right? And in initial stage, we, you do not plan these kind of bigger things. So this is something I feel is not correct. I mean, I know it, it looks a bit of uh, difficulty level is medium. I would still say you should risk it because at least you know three out of the four statements. I mean, small guesswork, you can go with your instinct, with your gut. You can still go with the uh, with this uh, guesswork because you are you have some idea. At least 75% knowledge you have about the question, right? One, you can say, okay, now this doesn't look fine. So my answer has to be three. That is the right answer. Now, that is the way you should be approaching. Don't get scared with the questions. Questions are there to scare you, but it is UPSC and you are UPSC aspirants, okay? So getting scared and uh, losing your nerve is not something you should aspire for. You have to hold your nerves for the two hours, keep yourself calm and then go with the best possible approach that you have. See, it is a war, guys, that you have to fight at any cost. The only options available that you have that time, use them properly and give your best shot. That is about the UPC prelims. It is designed to test your nerve, how good you are able to manage that kind of pressure. That is the whole idea of prelims, right? The next question is about which particular country is a member of the Comprehensive Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now this is again, now this particular question I would say if you have no idea, please skip it because this is too factual. I mean you can, cannot do any guesswork. Okay, this has to be there. If you are not aware of any of this, you are not aware of the members, please skip it because this question, these kind of questions are really tough. They have very little scope of applying logic or common sense here, right? You should know about it. You should know the fact here. So what is this uh, CPTPP agreement? It is a free trade agreement, okay? This much is okay. It is a free trade agreement. It is an agreement signed by 11 countries way back in 2018. Now, you, you guys must have heard about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I mean, this, this is the kind of partnership which was very much in the news at least 5 to 10 years back. But then later on, the Trans-Pacific Partnership could not be, could not come to the force. And now we have got the CP, CPTPP. This is something which you can see as a bigger version of this particular trade partnership. So 11 countries are the member. And since it is the free trade agreement, if you know a little bit basics about free trade agreement, it is always about that how the country, the members are going to eliminate or reduce the tariff. If you reduce the tariff, then only the more import exports you can do. That is the idea of free trade agreement. I should be more exporting to your country. You should be exporting more, or more to my country. But that is only possible if I have to reduce the tariff. Then only the trade becomes profitable, right? Okay. Now talking about the particular countries because the question is about the countries which are member or not. So CP double TP has 11 members and the major, the, the main members are the, the Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Bruni, Chile, Malaysia, Mexico, Peru, Singapore and Vietnam. Be very careful. USA is not there. In general, many times USA is a partner of these kind of thing. It's tricky. That's why I'm saying. Normally, you would expect USA to be part of bigger trade group because USA always go with the bigger trade groups. USA is always interested in these kind of partnerships. But surprisingly, 
the CPTPP does not have USA as the member. It is we have Canada, but not the USA. Normally, if you see any agreement, in normally you will always have USA and Canada together. In like ninety percent of the agreements, they always go together. To the surprise, USA is not a part of it. Something you should know more about it is the UK. UK is going to be uh, UK actually became the first European nation that have signed, but very surprisingly and interestingly, UK has still not ratified it. It become a permanent member only after it ratify. Why it has not ratified? Maybe, maybe because of the influence of the USA. We do not know the politics, but yes, UK is still to become a member of it. Now coming back to the question that we have. So here the question was asking about the members. We have just learned Australia being a member, Canada being a member, Singapore being a member, but not the USA. Answer has to be three. I am saying it's a tough question. You should not risk it. You should skip it if you are not sure. You can't not, cannot go with any kind of logic in these kind of questions, right? <clears throat> okay, ji. so going ahead with the question number eighty-nine. <clears throat> question eighty-nine was. Which of the following members countries is not careful asking not currently member of UNHRC, which is United Nation Human Rights Council? Okay, uh, let us say I have not read about this current affair. Okay, first of all, of course, I expect you guys to at least have some idea about UNHRC because these are important organizations, and it was in news also, especially after the Russia-Ukraine war. If you are following the news uh, uh, correctly. You know it was in news for many reasons. India generally, wherever there is uh, something to do with the humanity, any organization that is to do something with ethics, something with humanity, mostly India is always member of these kind of groups. India is member of UNHRC. In fact, India is one of the founding member of UNHRC. Here, if you go by little bit of uh, information that that you have in your head. It is. It was the Russia which was a part, but in 2022, Russia was eliminated from the group after Russia had started the war with the Ukraine. So currently, the it it is specifically saying currently not a member. So you have a good case that okay, USA, India, because they are more democratic countries, and in democracy you always value the human rights. I'm going just by the logic. I'm not going with any explanation. Just go by the logic. India, USA supposed to be part. Because we are the face of democracies. Even Vietnam, you may have, you may have this confusion. I I agree, but still, so definitely India USA is not going to be the answer. You may have a confusion between Vietnam and Russia because we do not have much idea about Vietnam. We don't have idea about the Russia also. But then again, the key word is currently. Probably you can think of the current affairs that has happened in the last twenty four year twenty four uh, months. It is a little bit medium level difficulty, but. I would say you should risk it because at least you have fifty-fifty chance. You should approach it. Go with Russia because Russia has recently been eliminated. Okay, UNHRC is an important group. You should have a basic information about it. It is the intergovernmental group talking about promoting and protection of all the human rights around the world. Headquarters being in uh, Geneva, forty-seven members in total. And uh, the best part about the UNHRC is. that it is it is actually praised all over the world because it has equitable geographical distribution you see many of the united nation bodies do not have good representation for example united nation security council is always being criticized that it does not give proper representation to the whole of the uh, whole of the world right i mean very less african countries are represented a lot of uh, south american countries are ignored but but this particular unhrc is something which is always lauded praised For having equitable geographical distribution, where it has it it has given thirteen seats to African countries, thirteen seats for Asia Pacific countries, and Latin American countries also have eight seats with Western European uh, countries being seven, Eastern European states being six. Okay, and here is the answer which you were looking for. Russia suspended two thousand and twenty two after the Ukraine war was there. Okay, rest all are the members. And uh, if you want to go with all the detail, you can read the PDF later on. I'm just asking you how to approach the question. <coughs> Now, question number ninety was again something that is very very important topic, and we all are talking about antimicrobial resistance. Now, this is probably one of the hot topics that is there, especially in the field of vaccine and uh, health. Now, AMR is something. I mean, I would say do prepare it well, guys. 
so the question is about the growing concerns of the antimicrobial resistance the it is in short called the amr which statement which of the following statement present the most significant ethical dilemmas for public health intervention now the important thing is the most significant ethical dilemma if you if you read all the four choices you would say sir somewhere everything looks correct the here the question is question is not difficult but sometimes the options are really really difficult so these kind of questions you have to go first try to eliminate which you think is the least possible okay always go with the, this method try to first figure out which is probably going to be the most wrong go with the most wrong first try keep eliminating in that and in the last you will have one or two statements that you can go for now if you know a little bit about amr that is something you must uh, talk about what is what is an antimicrobial resistance guys amr is something which is there so okay i'll i'll explain you a little bit about amr infection uh, so let's just say you have any um, you know micro any microbe that you have let's say your body get infected with any microbe beat beat virus beat uh, bacteria fungi you know protozoa any of the microbial uh, organism any pathogen is there and if that pathogen enters to your body you fall sick right now whenever we fall sick because of these we always go and take some medicines and for example if you are if you are uh, suffering from bacterial infection you go with the antibiotics right that is what we go for we go with the antibiotics so now there are two things if we are taking antibiotics indiscriminately we are using it for every small infection here and there and we are habitual of taking too many antibiotics what happens sometime let's say your body is having say five bacterial infection just a representation antibiotics you are taking and it is able to kill at least four of them but one somehow survived one bacterial infection somehow survived in your body mostly why it survives because either your body has become too habitual of the antibiotics or secondly probably you are not going to complete your course suppose it's a five day course many times what we do if we feel good in three to four days we stop taking our medicines so the incomplete use or overuse both cases overuse incomplete use always uh, give a tendency that some kind of residual infection stays in our body okay that one particular bacteria one kind of bacteria that stays in our body then actually become a super bug it becomes super bug means it becomes immune to that particular antibiotic next time doesn't matter how good antibiotics you are taking now that particular super bug is always going to resist the infection resist the uh, you know the job of the antibiotics it is always going to resist and antibiotics won't be able to uh, you know uh, improve your health because your body has super bugs now this kind of infection is called the amr antimicrobial resistance where the where the most prescribed medicines and vaccines are not able to cure you because your body has developed that super bug that is the basic idea now in this case it is asking you that which particular in which particular thing uh, public health intervention what's the most ethical dilemma for public health uh, authorities in case dealing with the antimicrobial i'll start with d2a investing in research and development for new antibiotics while addressing potentially equ equity issues in accessibility uh, okay that looks a bit of fine but i i do not need new antibiotics but that is not my priority okay in case of antimicrobial do you think researching and developing new because there is no no guarantee then people will start overusing it hai na the real problem is not going to get solved even if you have new antibiotics people will start overusing it and again the problem the core problem will reveal the same that cannot be my answer then you have implementing restrictive antibiotic prescribing policies while considering the economic impact on the pharmaceutical companies okay um, that makes sense i we should restrict antibiotic use and uh, there are many policies even in india where antibiotics are only given to you if you have proper prescriptions but that still is not going to be my core ethical dilemma i am more concerned about something else so this also logically does not uh, going to uh, you know satisfy the requirement of the question second statement says prioritizing access to essential antibiotics in low resource setting while potentially accelerating resistance in those regions again this is dilemma but not going to satisfy my need look at the first first statement balancing individual choice 
to the use of antibiotics while collective risk of antibiotic development that is something which i can think of in this particular that is the most ethical dilemma how you are going to impact the choice because ultimately i am the end user my individual of my individual choice whether to take antibiotic or not the the government policy the government organization the public health uh, intervention is about this how i am going to balance my antibiotic use and the collective risk that we that, that we have so overall you have to restrict the antibiotics again giving and informing and awareing the uh, the end users about their choice you know that is the that is the thing that you should they should be looking at i would say this particular kind of question is a medium level i would definitely attempt it i will i will read it it, it it's a time consuming question i understand you will have some time consumption but always try to read very carefully try to read and think yourself as a public health officer if you are the public health officer then probably what is going to be your uh, uh, this thing particularly what what is your priority about this so if you place yourself i think you will be able to solve this question answer has to be a what is amr i have already explained you right then question number 91 was about the paris club now this is a very important question paris club is is very much in the news these days so paris club which is an informal group of the creditor nations okay so creditor nations are those nations which are definitely going to be the developed countries i mean which country can give you a loan only the developed countries so we are actually targeting about the developed countries those countries which are rich countries only rich people can give the credit only the poor countries can't give can't give the credit so paris club informal group of the creditors plays crucial role in international debt restructuring what is debt restructuring if you are not able to pay your loan uh, then of course not your individual i'm talking about the international debt is basically the government to government debt okay uh, it is basically about the government to government debt not like the debt that i have taken for my personal use it's about the government of india debt that they have taken and uh, i think this is a very normal question and you can solve it with bit of information first i'll tell you some basics about it then we'll come back and discuss how you should approach this question so what is this paris club paris club is something that you should remember paris club is informal group we have already seen it is the uh, it is about the western countries it is the because western countries are considered to be the most rich countries most developed countries no so they are in a position to give credit to the poor countries to the developing countries so their major role of the paris group is they should find a sustainable solution to the payment difficulties if any country especially the debt debtor countries if uh, developing countries are having some issues and they are not able to repay their debt then comes the role of the paris club they help them out and f f f uh, help them figure out the sustainable solutions for that please remember india and china are not the member we can't be the member because india china are still not that rich not that developed that we start giving loans to the other countries so logically it is only restricted to the western countries also remember the uh, this particular group operates on the principles of consensus and solidarity you know that means that any agreement that is to be reached between the, the western countries and other countries it is going to be apply equally to all the paris club creditors that is that is what it is about the consensus and solidarity okay now one more thing important that you need to understand about this particular group that such kind of paris club groups of course they are only interested they only deal with the debt between the governments like of course you can't have one individual like vijay malya or any other person if let's say vijay malya will go to them and say okay give me some help me manage my debt it is not interested in any private debt it is only the debt that the governments have taken like government of sri lanka has taken some debt government of pakistan has taken some debt only them they are not going to handle any private or individual loan payment that is not their domain very clearly okay and one more important things about this group is that uh, the there are some observer countries also we have some full time members some uh, observer countries are there now india is one such country india is one such observer uh, country and observers cannot participate in negotiation itself the the observer countries are only for the discussion part they can offer technical advice but of course observer countries are not supposed to participate in the negotiation itself that is the job of the core members only they do that obviously why would observer will be given that much power no 
Now, in case of the Paris Club, you should remember some of the major names of observer, India being an observer. Then we have the IMF, World Bank, OECD, all these big multilateral development banks, they are also the observers of the Paris Club. They participate, they offer their advice, but don't get into the details of negotiations. Okay. Now, if you come back to the question, now this question, first statement says, operate on principles of consensus and solidarity. Yes, we, we uh, have seen that, that is the case and uh, they deal only between the debt of the government does not handle the private i mean this much this is something you can all you can also figure out with the common sense there is absolutely no group which is going to help the individual debtor because individual default is something you have done because of your wrong finances only the governments are bailed out internationally they are only interested in the countries not the individual member right so that is also correct third statement says observer countries attend the meeting yes uh, they can't uh, participate in negotiation. I think this is okay. I, I would say it's a medium kind of question. Simply by uh, having a bit, little bit of uh, logic and little bit of luck, you should attempt this question. Uh, it is not that difficult. Looks difficult. The statements are a bit long, but still you can figure out and uh, try to read about important organization that is important. Question 90 is very interesting question. It is about the Southern Light. What is the Southern Light? Now, at least you should know about Southern Light. If you have absolutely no idea about the Southern Light, it is again something you need fact. You, you need to have a deep knowledge for uh, attempting this question. You must have heard the term Auroras, right? You, you must have heard the term Auroras. So, there are two types of Auroras. Auroras in the Northern Hemisphere, we call them as Aurora Borealis, and uh, which is also called the Northern Lights. And the aurora at the southern pole is what you call as aurora australis and that is called the southern lights. Okay. Now, what exactly auroras? First, you need to know the uh, uh, meaning of the auroras and then we will come back to the question because it's a little bit of tough question. I, I understand it's a tough question, but how you should approach, I'll tell you guys. So, what exactly are the auroras? Now, this is very important and interesting. Now, if you, you, you have, you must be aware of the different layers of the earth, right? So, earth atmosphere has many layers. We have the troposphere, we have the stratosphere, we have the mesosphere, then we have the thermosphere and then we have the exosphere. These are the five standard layers of the earth atmosphere. Now, in this, the thermosphere, we have one particular, within thermosphere, we have a layer called the ionosphere, okay? This particular ionosphere is the one which is having the charged particles. Ionosphere, the word ion, what is an ion? Ion is the ion is the charged particle. So ionosphere is the is the layer of the atmosphere having the charged particles of oxygen and nitrogen. Okay. And exosphere is one particular and this is particular layer which is considered to be not the original part of our uh, atmosphere. It is the gravity of the earth that has actually attracted this outer layer. This is the outermost layer and it goes up to 10,000 kilometer. So everything which is beyond thermosphere is exosphere. It gradually merges with the space. The outermost layer exosphere has one particular, uh, uh, you know, layer within it itself that is called the magnetosphere. Magnetos uh, magnetosphere is a part of the exosphere. As the name suggests, magnetosphere means something to do with the magnetic properties, right? Something to do with magnetic properties that is magnetosphere. So what exactly happens, guys? You see, the, the charged particles from the sun, sun also gives away all the charged particles, no? which are called the solar flares. So all the charged particles from the sun, when they are redirected towards all the planets, including the earth. So now all the charged particles which are coming, which are coming, they are all going to be attracted towards the magnetosphere because magnetosphere is something that will attract those char uh, charged particles. And those charged particles, when they are attracted towards the magnetosphere, they are going to be redirected. You must have heard about the magnetic uh, uh, lines of the force. So earth act as a bar magnet and earth has its own, uh, you know, magnetic lines of force. You guys must have heard about them. You must know about them. So now the charged particles which are coming from the sun, all thanks to magnetosphere got attracted and they are redirected towards the magnetic lines of the force. Now, you know the magnetic lines of the force has enter and exit at the polar areas, right? That is the common diagram you must have seen, no? These are the <coughs> different, different magnetic line of forces that we have, which are leaving and entering the earth. That is a magnetic sphere that earth has. All the magnetic field 
is basically made up made up of these magnetic lines of forces so all the charged particles thanks to magnetosphere are going to get collected majorly collected at the poles and at the polar areas when these charged particles collected by magnetosphere when they have their interaction with the ionosphere this particular there are a lot of layer when they have the interaction with the ionosphere which already has charged particles then there is something interesting happens and that particular uh, uh, phenomena give a very specific bending pattern what kind of bending pattern look at this particular bending pattern that you can see now these are the beautiful lights which are being produced why they are produced because of all the ions all the charged particles which of the um, ionosphere when they are interacting with the charged particles collected by the magnetosphere when they are interacting and where they interact the most i told you at the polar areas because polar areas you have the strongest magnetic field why because they are the areas where magnetic lines of force are entering and leaving so strongest magnetic force we have at the polar areas and that is what called the northern lights in case of northern hemisphere and they are called southern lights in case of southern hemisphere i hope you have this basic idea now let us go to the question and uh, isn't it beautiful guys i mean i would always say go and visit the north south pole you will love them when you see these kind of phenomena for yourself okay okay now coming back to the question what is this question about the it is about the southern lights we are talking about aurora australis okay so you have to identify what is the main reason why we have colors and the bands see why do we see the bands first statement says it is because of excitation of the oxygen nitrogen molecule at different altitude by solar wind particles number one interact it is not the case uh, there has to be charged particles we have just seen interaction of the charged particle from magnetosphere yes magnetosphere involvement is must okay and that too with the with specific electronic transitions with earth ionosphere that looks absolutely correct we have just understood uh, ionosphere magnetosphere particles has to interact okay so second looks fine third says reflecting sunlight of it is never about reflection of the sunlight i mean reflection of the sunlight has nothing to do with the southern lights clearly wrong fluorescence atmospheric gases due to ultraviolet radiation of the sun absolutely not so southern light northern light the whole phenomena of the auroras depend on the interaction of magnetic sphere ionosphere answer has to be a now of course i understand this is a tough question you cannot attempt it if you do not know the basics it is tough i would say if you still have to risk it then risk at least when you are sure when you are able to eliminate when you have 50 50% chance then you should risk it otherwise skip it it's a tough question very factual you should know the phenomena in depth then only you are able to do that right 90 question number 93 what this question is all about let's figure out question 93 is innovate in india program i i i think you should know we have already discussed this particular innovation in the last video so i3 program is under which of the following programs it is under national biopharma mission we already have explained you national biopharma mission i told you is the mission which is co-funded by uh, the world bank world bank is uh, you know giving us 50% share this particular biopharma we have it is implemented by birak and it has its one of the mission as innovate in india i think this is a very easy question <coughs> this is an you know uh, this is an easy question but again if you have to do the guesswork don't do the guesswork because it is not for the guesswork it is only for those who know it about it see because innovation can be any field can be quantum mission can be hydrogen can be supercomputer it can be anything but as of now it is about the biopharma mission so easy if you have read it otherwise don't take risk you don't have much scope to do the guesswork so you already have we already have discussed the national biopharma mission it is industry academia collaboration uh, it is all about accelerating the biopharmical development in india india wants to be the giant india wants to be leader of biopharmaceutical developments so government of uh, india has done this i3 mission uh, it is about promoting entrepreneurship indigenous manufacturing is the main base implementing agency is birak and it was launched in 2017 with the cost of 1500 crores 50% co-funded by the world bank and that is all about the this particular mission now there are some major uh, you know uh, understanding or vision about it that you can read 
from the from these slides like it is about development of the products it is also about upgrading the share infrastructure facilities it also talk about developing human capital it also talk about technology transfers that is all about that details you can read we already have discussed these details uh, in the previous question that was in part 3 question number 94 was about the c initiatives now in front of you there are some c initiatives which are given all of them are c initiative there is no doubt we have black sea synergy eastern partnership southern neighborhood and baltic strategy but you have to figure out which of these are launched specifically by european union that is very tricky question very tough i would say because again it is a fact based question and question wanted you to figure out which of them are not among the main c initiatives of european union these are very very tough questions guesswork will not do any good logic will not be apl applied here it is tough i would say you should skip it because ultimately there is no point unnecessary risking it you should skip these kind of questions if you do not have the idea about it now you first learn about these uh, uh, few missions few uh, c initiatives so what is the baltic sea strategy baltic sea strategy you know baltic sea strategy is about addressing the environmental challenges it is about promoting sustainable development among all the countries including uh, around the baltic sea i just told you about the baltic nations baltic countries no so baltic area is something which is very much in the news so yes it is the it is one of the main strategies yes it is part of uh, the sea initiatives by european union then also the black sea synergy which is about uh, improving regional cooperation economic development around the black sea region both are the part of the strategy but again the two here one is about the southern neighborhood which is about which is about the mediterranean sea the southern neighborhood is a partnership where it, it talk about how we can promote the stability in the countries all the countries around the mediterranean sea and this is not a part of the main european union plus something which is of mediterranean probably european union is not that much interested because mediterranean is not only the core domain of europe now you talk about the baltic sea black sea these are the two areas where you have more control of the europe that of, of the european union that you can think of mediterranean something which is still open and also a gateway to the africa not very much of the domain of european union what about the eastern partnership it is also not a part of uh, the c initiatives eastern partnership partnership you think about the eastern europe what is eastern europe more about the countries like the post soviet countries eastern eurasia eastern europe is something which is also not considered to be as a main europe when you think of the term europe it is only the western europe which is more developed having more kind of close relationship eastern europe is all about those countries part which used to be part of the soviet union like armenia azerbaijan belarus georgia Mold moldova and ukraine so yes in this particular case you have the answer it's a tough one i understand do not do not uh, risk it you should skip this kind of question uh, right answer has to be <clears throat> the black sea is correct and so one and four are correct oh sorry you have to figure out which is not correct na huh? so two and three is the right answer because these two are not part and uh, one and four are the part upsc will ask you these kind of questions they always want to surprise you they always want to shake you <laughs> that's what upsc is all about the next question is probably very simple question i think this is probably one of the easy easiest question of a test series you are giving the the port and you have to figure out the location port busan is not north korea it is south korea now how you should remember i like if i have to guess it i i have seen a movie there was a very famous there is a very famous movie called uh, uh, train to busan i don't know if you have seen it or not there is a movie called train to busan and uh, you know it's a korean movie and which korea makes good movies it's the south korea so busan is probably a probably a, a city of uh, or, or a port of a uh, south korea okay so i since i have seen the movie it's a zombie movie by the way so i would i would definitely would have guessed that south korea has to be the right answer not the north korea okay see north korea you will not find north korea into any good progressive thing you always have north korea mentioned in some or some of the negative senses uh, north korea has nothing much to offer in in terms of positivity or positive things so north korea but, uh, port busan is uh, south korea hamburg is not france hamburg it's a very basic port you should know about the major ports it's very very important port of germany and if you have read about the first world war and the second world war there also you will have the mention of the hamburg port very important 
uh, it is about Germany. Jaleb, uh, Jabail Ali port is UAE, it is correct. It was actually in the news also. India has done some agreement with the UAE and uh, India is also going to cooperate the Jabail Ali port. So third statement is right, it is only one. These are easy questions. Only you have to apply is bit of knowledge of the maps. If you are good with that, I think you should attempt it. Uh, don't let these kind of questions skip from your head. You can't simply leave everything to the luck, okay? Now, the next question is about the CBI, the Central Bureau of Investigation. You know every reason why it is so much in the news, right from the posting of the chair of the director of the CBI, from there to the way CBI is operating into the country these days. It is having some negative news itself uh, attached with itself. Opposition is criticizing the CBI that uh, center is misutilizing. So lots of lots of news of the CBI is there in the in the uh, in your news. If you have some organization coming so frequently in the news, definitely become something for UPSC material. Now, before I actually get into the detail, you need to know a bit of the CBI. Then you will be very easily you can solve the questions. Okay. So CBI is something which is non non constitutional non statutory it you do not have any separate act of the parliament so how how does this then CBI operate CBI is more of an executive body it derive its power from one particular act called Delhi police special uh, Delhi special police establishment act 1946 this is very very important people often think there is some separate uh, 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 act of parliament but no it is the CBI is all taking it power from this one. This is important. You should remember about it, guys. And CBI is very important. It's the nodal agency in India. Whenever you have to, uh, you know, coordinate investigations on the behalf of the Interpol, you know about the Interpol, right? Interpol is international police. The international police called Interpol. It is the CBI, which is the nodal agency that cooperates on behalf of our country. Lots and lots of people have one big mistake, one big misunderstanding. They always think that CBI is, is under the Home Ministry, but it is not. The CBI actually co comes under the Department of Personal, Ministry of Personal Prevention Public Grievances. This is the right ministry for the CBI because we often, like, like the way we always think about the ED, na? ED is also Ministry of Finance. Okay, so these two bodies are very much in the news. So always remember, it is Ministry of Finance for the ED, Ministry of Personal for the CBI. We often think they are Home Ministry, but they are not. Okay, remember. When it comes to the CBI, guys, it is important for you to remember, all the directors of the CBI, they are appointed by a committee where the Prime Minister is the chairperson of the committee. So Prime Minister being the chairman and there are two other people involved in that committee and other people are the Chief Justice of India. In case he is not available, even Supreme Court judge can, or can also be part in case CGI is not available. And then we have the leader of the opposition. Very, very important. Okay, LOP. So these are the three people of the committee. And based on the majority two is to one kind of ratio, they decide who is going to be the director of the CBI. That is the appointment process. But always remember one thing. You guys need to uh, know one thing. Ultimately, the CBI... The major work of the CBI, its major mandate is focus on all the kind of economic offenses, the corruption cases, all the major crimes that are having, that are being done within the national security implications. CBI, you should know one more thing that it is, it has its own dedicated investigation officer. It is not dependent on other uh, organization or deputy kind of thing. CBI has its own investigation officers. It has its own legal team where, which, which will handle all the cases. And the fourth statement that you will see there, one thing you need to understand, how the CBI works when it comes to the authorization operational capacity of the CBI. Remember, central government is the one that actually authorized the CBI to investigate crimes in the states. But always remember, for CBI to, you know, go and do some investigation in the state, you need to have state consent. The word is consent. There are two types of the consent of the gov state government. The consent can be of two types. One can be one is called the general consent and the other is called the specific. And even this particular thing was very much in the news. So what, what exactly happens if central government wants CBI to go investigation case, investigate a case in some particular state, it is always see if the state has given general or specific consent. What happens exactly? 
सपोज यू हैव मध्य प्रदेश नाउ इन मध्य प्रदेश यू हैव द बीजेपी गवर्नमेंट इन पावर इन सेंटर यू हैव द बीजेपी ऑलमोस्ट इट्स आई एम नॉट सेंग इट्स ऑलवेज द रूल बट इन जनरल द स्टेट्स विच आर वेरी मच क्लोज टू द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट दे गिव अ जनरल कंसेंट जनरल कंसेंट टू द सी बी आई मीन्स यू डोंट एवरी टाइम यू डोंट हैव टू अप्लाई फॉर कंसेंट यू कैन गो फ्रीली विदाउट एनी रोक टोक यू कैन गो एंड डू योर इन्वेस्टिगेशन जनरल कंसेंट इज समथिंग यू डोंट हैव टू गिव अगेन एंड अगेन बट मेनी टाइम्स वॉट यू सी स्पेशली द ऑपोजिशन स्टेट्स नाउ रिसेंटली तमिलनाडु वेस्ट बेंगाल पंजाब यू नो ऑल दीज स्टेट्स दे हैव विदड्रॉन द जनरल कंसेंट दे हैव विदड्रॉन द जनरल कंसेंट एंड नाउ एवरी टाइम सी बी आई हैज टू गो टू दीज पर्टिकुलर स्टेट्स दे हैव टू आस्क फॉर स्पेसिफिक परमिशन स्पेसिफिकली दे हैव टू आस्क दैट शेल वी ऑपरेट इन योर स्टेट और नॉट ओके सो दैट कंसेंट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट स्टेट हैज अ वेरी बिगर रोल इन द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट हैज अ वेरी बिगर रोल इन हाउ सी बी आई इज गोइंग टू बी ऑथराइज और नॉट ओके ना वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग दिस इज समथिंग यू विल ऑलवेज हैव अ पॉलिटिकल डेडलॉक समटाइम्स देर आर सिचुएशन वेयर यू डू नॉट नीड स्टेट गवर्नमेंट वेन If Supreme Court or the High Court has ordered CBI to investigate and go to the Gujarat or Tamil Nadu or West Bengal, any state, if the court has directed CBI to go and investigate, then even without the consent, they can go and do their work. They do not need state consent in that particular case. Okay. And one more thing, if let's say if the state has withdrawn the general consent, like for example Tamil Nadu and all these states have withdrawn. if the general consent is withdrawn what happens to the cases which are already ongoing see all the ongoing cases are not going to get impacted ongoing cases can still be investigated by the cbi even after withdrawal of general consent only there can be no fresh cases no fresh cases can be registered in those states which do not give the general consent but all the ongoing uh, they do not have much of the impact right they will go smoothly without any problem now i would like to take you to the question because that is the uh, major thing we have to figure out so now you have learned something about the cbi now try to attempt this question in a very easy manner so cbi appointed director yes we have a committee pm as chairperson and we have cgi and leader of opposition absolutely correct cbi investigation economic offenses yes we have already seen that cbi has its own independent investigation force yes it it has now the four statement very careful it says CBI can register cases only upon request from the state government concerned no no that is not the case it is not only so now you now you know many cases it can be the state government request even the center can direct even the courts can direct right so again the keyword is only wherever you have these words only all exclusive minimum you know anything which is like that try to apply some of the logic yes this is wrong so i would say this is an easy question i do not see this as a difficult one easy one please attempt it you you know basics about the cbi you have read it so many times the answer has to be only 3 that is c okay and i have also given you idea about the general consent and the specific consent you may have a question in your exam based on that the next question is about the tribal advisory councils and the north eastern council if you remember we have discussed about the tac we when we were discussing about the fifth schedule uh, we have read about it we have discussed about that and north eastern council is something we also have mentioned it is about uh, the development of the north eastern states of, of our country okay now you have to figure out now please uh, have a look at the basics then i will i will tell you how to approach it the basics that you should know about it is as per the constitution of india you know what this uh, what this fifth and sixth schedule is all about right so uh, every tribal every state that has some tribal population every state that has scheduled tribe area the scheduled area within them you need to have a tribal advisory council and that is mentioned under the fifth schedule of india for particularly sixth schedule you have uh, particular states of 80 mm it is the assam tripura meghalaya Miz uh, uh, mizoram where you have the they were they are covered in sixth other than these four all states having tribal areas are part of the fifth schedule okay and as per the constitution fifth schedule every schedule area shall have a tribal advisory council which is also called the tac the major objective of tac is to advise on the matter of the welfare advancements of the scheduled tribe to the governor see ultimately i told you all the scheduled areas actually operate under the president it is the responsibility of the president of india to administer that scheduled areas okay 
and uh, how does the uh, president do that president directs the governor and all, via governor all the administration is taken care of because we have the tribal advisory council the main objective of tribal advisory is about the welfare of the people of the tribal areas right so these advisory councils always give their inputs always talk about the uh, uh, welfare of the of their tribes and they give their suggestions to the governor that is when very obvious thing always remember when it comes to northeastern states we have northeastern council as a very very important player you you must have heard that very recently there was a there, there is a ministry which is being assigned we have created a new ministry uh, called the ministry of development of the northeastern states ministry of donor also we call it and for that we have this northeastern council which is the nodal agency for this particular ministry and they are statutory advisory bodies necs are statutory advisory bodies because we have constituted them under the northeastern um, council act 1971 and they have their headquarters in shillong okay now that is something you should know because northeastern is something which i think is going to be very important topic for upsc 2024 be it the map of uh, uh, these uh, states i mean you you will fee, you will also say that the map of the northeast becomes important for us why because lots of questions do come from the map of the northeast beat uh, the bordering areas with, like for example assam share its boundary with which of the following uh, states okay so there are only two state uh, only uh, uh, you know one state that is sikkim with which it is not sharing its uh, boundary otherwise every state has boundary with assam so these kind of questions are very common now also they are important because Uh, uh the northeast is the area where you you have the maximum number of international border so you have international border with bhutan you have international border with bangladesh international border with myanmar so obviously northeastern map is something you should very carefully look for always try to remember which northeastern state has boundary with which international boundary and what are the domestic boundaries that it has right and also remember the northeastern council which is the nodal agency always include the uh, governor always include chief minister of the eight member states and which are these eight state we have the seven sisters we call these as seven sister and they have their one brother called sikkim remember sikkim is not part of seven sister seven sisters is the name for seven northeastern states sikkim is considered to be win, win one bigger brother the chairman and three members which are also part of this nominated by the president okay come to the question let's see what the question was asking guys so question was about the uh, tac and the northeastern council so first statement says duty of the tac to advise matters welfare of the scheduled tribe yes they always refer to the president now this is very obvious why just try to apply the logic why probably these councils are made obviously for the welfare of the tribal people and governor is supposed to be the best person for for all the state matter so first is correct second says the nec statutory body under the council focus a social economic uh, northeastern state that is also very correct third statement says nec comprises chief minister of all northeastern state as ex officio along with the other experts yes so we have seen all three are absolutely correct now this kind of question it is it is bit medium i am not say it is very easy but do attempt it and in such a, in such cases you just have to have a basic information basic knowledge is enough and you should definitely attempt it it is not something even if you are not very sure you can risk it i mean you can still go for it but i would say they are easy questions and you should have understanding of the fifth schedule sixth schedule and now uh, considering my experience uh, upsc will ask you questions from fifth sixth schedules because lot of news we had uh, there from the northeastern states of india okay now next question is about the invasive species now this is something which is a tough question why tough because all the four options they are all inclusive plant but it is very specifically asking you have to figure out invasive plant which is notorious for ability to climb coil and trail deciduous which is native to east asia and southeast asia known for japanese arrow uh, root and chinese arrow root now this is too specific i mean you there is absolutely no chance of guesswork if you are not aware please avoid taking risk you should not take a risk i would say skip it because every you have heard of water hyacinth you have heard of uh, eucalyptus all are invasive but you cannot be very sure which particular it is asking now in this case the answer is called the kudzu vine kudzu vine is the right answer now one small one small hint i can see here is 
the wine what is a wine you have these long wines you know which are which basically come into the creeper category now wines are the creepers that 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 spread on the ground probably that can be a keyword for this you know ability to climb that it may strike to you in case it strikes then you can risk it but otherwise uh, sometimes our brain doesn't work like that sometimes we are under so much pressure but the only keyword i can see is wine which is a creeper and only creepers are able to climb right <laughs> and they can coil uh, all these the water hyacinth itself is water so it it is not going to climb of course uh, eucalyptus you have seen eucalyptus are more of a, a, a stick to the ground they often grow as a, a plant so i can by logic i can go and derive sometimes if you are not sure then don't take risk otherwise you can take the risk if you have some ability to figure out it there okay so this is about the kudzu wines question number 99 was about the statement question 99 talks about which biodiversity site located in the kerala this is this is important interesting why please look at the question the way question is being framed you have to figure out the biodiversity site it has to be located in kerala okay and that site you have to locate which has a biodiversity heritage site it is it should also be known for the mangrove system the keyword is mangrove there are a lot of heritage biodiversity sites in kerala but every biodiversity site does not have a mangrove system and it must also have diverse resident bird life i mean there are a lot of uh, uh, this thing the lot of if and buts are there okay but the keywords i have i have circled the keywords kerala biodiversity heritage mangrove and bird life first do you see any any of the wildlife sanctuary which is not a part of kerala well i can see the rangnath uh, thitu this is not a part of uh, kerala it belongs to karnataka hai na so this i can straight away eliminate now my only struggle is to figure out between the neyar ashtamudi and vemnadu now i have to figure out i have to go with satisfying both the things mangrove ecosystem is not something that we have at all the places now if you look at the you look at the um, options it is going to be the ashtamudi wetland ashtamudi ashtamudi wetland is very very famous actually very famous uh, because it has very exclusive uh, mangrove system mangroves are very very important ecosystems guys they have diverse flora and fauna mangroves are are those kind of uh, uh, plants they grow even in the in the ocean water okay even in the saline water they can grow very very easily and they are they are a very unique ecosystem in themselves but let me tell you everywhere you don't have the mangroves like for example if you go with the ashtamudi wetland system there you have the mangroves and also uh, remember one thing about this wetland ashtamudi lake is also a ramsar site ramsar site means it is it is uh, considered to be wetland of international importance how many total uh, ramsar sites do we have right now india has 80 ramsar sites okay there was 75 very recently few days back i mean i think uh, on uh, on sec, uh, 2nd of the february which is celebrated as a world wetland day we have added five new ramsar sites now i i will I, i will also try to give you one very important information here guys do keep a track on all the new ramsar sites at least the last 5 10 new sites you expect question which particular ramsar site now these five that has been added please read about them in which particular states they are you have to you have to read it in india the maximum number of ramsar sites we have in we have is in tamil nadu tamil nadu has approximately i think 16 or something uh, uh, ramsar site the maximum number of ramsar sites are in this ramsar site are those which are uh, uh, considered to be wetland of international importance it is under the ramsar convention which was signed 1971 to conserve all the important uh, wetlands of the of the world okay that is important if 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 they ask you which country has the maximum ramsar site then it is uk uk has approximately 175 ramsar sites in country it is uk state it is tamil nadu okay important rest i told you this particular is in karnataka cannot be the answer nayar wildlife is something which is which is famous uh, uh, for majorly the mammals in nayar wildlife it is it is about the terrestrial ecosystem so cannot fulfill the requirement of mangroves right yes vemnaya vemnath is something that can confuse you no doubt vemnath is famous for its bird population especially the migrant birds but then again 
it it is not going to qualify with the mangrove part so you you may have doubt with this uh, so called uh, uh, c and uh, uh, d clearly not two are there but yes i can still go with my guesswork and uh, i think you should risk this kind of questions applying little bit of knowledge if you have if if in case you have absolutely no idea then don't go and don't uh, you know attempt these kind of questions now i have the last question for you this is again it it looks like as if we are talking about a hardcore map question but see even in this question you have some important clue now this question number 100 was about the renowned tiger reserve in central india the key word is central india central india when you think of central india it has to have the madhya pradesh i must think about madhya pradesh because that is the heart of india no that is the central india so which tiger reserve is in central india famous for national park and offer okay fine rest of the thing is not of my much use now i am more concentrated on figuring out the uh, uh, tiger reserve of central india okay so if you if you look at these if you look at this now ranthambore i am very much heard of it is in rajasthan it is not part of central india straight away i can cancel i think of uh, kaval i think of tadoba tadoba and kaval are also not the case in madhya pradesh we have the famous world called as bandhavgarh it is in madhya pradesh no so has to be the right answer so even if you go by little of I, this is an easy question i would not say it's a tough one you just need to figure out uh, the the places you just need to have a good knowledge because at least i expect you guys to know uh, about the tiger reserves and also the elephant reserves you, uh, at least go and practice them on the map i mean i i have i have shared uh the map of the tiger reserves and the elephant reserves at least you are expected to i'm not saying that you have to cram it but at least look at the tiger reserves and uh, elephant reserves which are of great importance so definitely attempt these kind of questions just to add to your information guys if you if you look at that uh if you look at uh, look at on the map look this is the tiger reserves of india so when you are when you will be reading a pdf do practice it on the map at least once read it then you will have a good understanding so look at this this particular uh, uh, tadoba look at the tadoba one tadoba is something you have in maharashtra okay this is something you have in maharashtra if you look at the kaval kaval you will have in telangana and uh, clearly we have um, bandavgarh is this one this is the bandavgarh this one so here is the central india we are talking about lies in the madhya pradesh ranthambore is clearly very far away it is part of rajasthan so even by choosing that keyword you can go attempt these kind of questions so that is all from my side in this particular video i hope you have learned you have enjoyed and i really want you guys to give give us a feedback how you like this idea where we we are talking about the level of difficulty and the approach if you have learned something from this video if you have enjoyed this particular session then go, do give us a thumbs up and for more such kind of test series go and check out our complete test series of the test of the of the 10 tests the link is given in the uh, below uh, description go and check it out that is the kind of level we are providing and that too at a very effective cost you can get all the 10 tests at a very effective price of 1499 if you are already a subscriber of uh, pmf is current affairs you can simply get it at a very affordable price of 499 so i think Uh, i think uh, you have learnt something from this video so do check out uh, check out our uh, uh, this all the tests thank you so much signing off my name is uh, my name is ashish malik see you guys in the next video test number 2 discussion going live very very soon jai hind jai bharat